Clay, I'm glad you could join us. And for those of us who are uh, mm. not on the YouTubes, you look like you just got done with some sleazy carnal <laughs> meat sack. Oh, you know me. <laughs> Leaving my grease all over the place. So sticky. Everything's so greasy in here. Do you get the dust where if you don't clean it for a long time, it gets really sticky and like you got to scrub it to get it off shit? Or is that just me in my trash house? Is it like in the kitchen? It uh, no, it's like I, it's been out just outside. <laughs> is, the kitchen. Is, I think it, it, I think it's it sneaking comes up on from you right the kitchen. Now. <laughs> I think it is honestly. It's grease because, because I yeah, it's grease yeah, particles. There's, yeah. it's disgusting, and it always it's always before I notice it, it's too late, and everything is it's tough filthy. to clean. My father it has, is. My father's redoing their cabinets now because mostly because they were so. Uh, Greasy, sticky from the the vent didn't work in the kitchen essentially, so it's just like oh, a, yeah. a grease uh, cabinet mess, and they had to redo everything. But it's just grease, and as you say, once it gets there, you can't get it off unless you're going to do some sort of serious labor to get the the things clean. So don't let it start. Smokey the Bear says only you can prevent <laughs> grease traps on your cabinets. Uh, this is it. Our first post holiday, is it? No, we had yeah. an episode. It's po- po- yeah. New Year. The first episode of the New Year. That's what this one is. Sure. Happy New Time Year. Time means nothing to me anymore. Happy 2024, everybody. I have only really begun to notice the last few years that um, after Christmas, between Christmas and New Year's is, could could be any length of time. I have no idea. I don't know what day it is. I don't know how long it takes. It goes by quick. It's I just, find it goes by much yeah. quicker than it used to. I, I feel like it it's used quick, to be a long but time, I but. like I I completely forgot we were even doing this because yeah. I didn't remember what day it was. No, because there's no nothing to really like. No, there's no, no star to orient, <laughs> no star to orient yeah. yourself against. We were traveling. We had we did Christmas with with the family like yesterday. Mm-hmm. So because we had to delay it for on one side of the face. So it's just that kind of thing where it all gets it all gets mixed mixed up. I know. I've been off work this whole week too, so I'm like. Is it Friday? Is it yeah. Tuesday? What the, what the hell's going on? This is Revulsion. It's like that blender that got recalled. I saw that in the news. It had a name similar to that. This is episode mm-hmm. five of the fourth season of Star Trek Voyager. It came out on the 1st of October, 1997. Written by Lisa Klink, directed by Kenneth Biller, good old Kenny B, in universe dates 51186.2, which is 2374. In Revulsion, the doctor meets another sentient hologram and tries to help the troubled program with his problems. So, odd synopsis. I think this, I mean, so, I guess that's technically true, but it's a strange Sort one. of. Yes. The he, doctor doesn't really do a lot of helping. He doesn't, he doesn't try all that much either. So, no. it's, it's, it is what it is. But it's our, uh, it's our recurring guest star, Leland, what's his name? Oster? Oyster? Something like that? Uh, Orster? Orser. Orser. Leland Orser. Better known as the he made me fucker guy. He made me fucker guy, and uh, in the great Carpenter Street episode of Enterprise, he's the sleaze ball in that. So he's got to start. He's a great sle- He's a great nervous sleaze ball. Yeah. Very good at that. Yeah. Plays a <clears throat> plays a character here who's a hologram. Um, who uh, it's not even really a mystery. Just kills everybody. <laughs> kills all his crew, and that's about it. So I'm in I'm in a tough spot with these ones now. The I was thinking. I was thinking of how to rate this one, um, mm. and not to get ahead of the head of the game or anything. But I think we're so we're at an interesting point in Voyager, right? This season of Voyager is definitely more interested in character work than any prior season of the show, and which is good. Agree. Which I applaud that. I like that. I think that's good. Um, I think I'm now starting to like recalibrate myself to where what that means and. So my takeaway from this one was I thought this was an okay episode that has a ton of problems in it. Like I kind (laughs) of enjoyed watching it, but as as, after it was over, it was like, that doesn't, even while it was happening, I was like, this doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense (laughs) as to what's going on. Just, it has these like, you know, I thought the character work was fine and we can get into that, but it was was just fine. It was like, this is okay. This is not terrible. Uh, the sci-fi hologram doctor plot, I thought just ran into a whole lot of like, why is this person doing this? Like, why don't they just do this? Why don't they just do right. that? Why can't this happen? Um, so that was a little bit distracting, but I thought it was an okay episode outside of that. Yeah, I I really enjoyed the Seven and Harry stuff. I thought that was fun, and I thought it was, like, I, at this point, I'm just more interested in 
Seven as a character. Yeah. And yeah. Leland Orser. But because uh, but that stuff just wasn't like I couldn't really get much of a of a feel for what they were really trying to do with it. If you're, anything. Talking, about the hol- like, you're talking about the hologram yeah, story. Yeah. The hologram story. Because like <clears throat> the doctor might as well have not even really been there. Um, although I, <laughs> I was getting shades of like, you know, when you've got a coworker who you've never really talked to before and you finally get to talk to them and then you can tell that they're kind of like testing the waters to see how quickly and how intensely they can get racist, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. where it's immediately, like, yeah, you know how, you know how humans are, right? You know what I'm we're, talking We're about. on the same page. Uh, Gives you the yeah. eyes thing. Yeah. But, um. You know, they're just like they're just all greasy everywhere, <laughs> chewing yeah, their okay. chewing their decaying plant matter and their beast meat. Yeah, but it was like I don't know. I don't really know what I was supposed to get out of it. Um, I didn't find it to be enlightening for Bolana at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, or this the is a, this is a very very bad day for Bolana. That's what the episode could have been called too, where <laughs> she gets her heart ripped. Having a lot of those heart ripped out by hologram, and then hit on the head with a hammer. And seems to be okay yeah. with it, though. It just gets up after and, she gets after she gets very awkwardly, forcibly kissed by Tom Paris. Yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. I, I just I don't know. I, I you know there was nothing. I couldn't find much of a like a thematic link. No, there's none for Bolana or the Doctor. Um, you know, I guess it's interesting for the Doctor because he's meeting another person or another one of his kind but even there it's he doesn't really care that much he, well, he, uh, seems, he, he, he cares seems more enough. interested he seems more interested than i think that he would be it's not, like he he's not an unusual unique thing right like i, I think it's yeah. canon that a lot of the ships have these emhs now so it's not like he's like this novelty like data that there's never been another yeah. data so meeting a data is kind of interesting i was struck by um how quickly they've gone into abandoning any sense of like the holograms the holograms have no dataness to them whatsoever they're just people really who happen to be holograms yeah and i found that a little bit strange in the fact that it's like you know the doctor's like well he's been locked into this like you know coal furnace and they didn't let him out and you could you could understand how anyone would go crazy doing that and i was like yeah, but he's a he's a program yeah, like designed for that. So computer program, yeah. <laughs> like who? Why, why am I to immediately assume that this is a problem at all? I guess. And so I, I felt like that was one of those things that I thought was strange was that the holograms both. There's nothing unique about the doctor's point of view in that being a hologram who wants to be free is novel at this point. It just seems that all holograms want to be free, and so this one yeah. is too. And I just like. I didn't think that that was particularly interesting. I feel like the char- the the guest star depends a lot on the performance here, which is good, but there's not really I don't care about this character. I don't think he's particularly interesting or anything like that. And you know, on the sci-fi angle, I'm just looking at it going like how does Bolana sneak around on the ship at all? Doesn't this thing know exactly where Bolana is and like what's going on and you know, his attack on her heart felt weird too. It's like, well, how long does this take to kill somebody? If you can that's reach the, the thing, that's the thing a reverse flash does. He vibrates his hand so fast that he it gets to kill go- Barry's mom. <laughs> Hopefully it kills people though. I, she, she put up quite a fight for having her heart squeezed to death. Basically yeah. was, was my take. And then the not, flash does it quite a bit in the flash movie. Too. Oh, does he? Okay. He's just like willy nilly <laughs> squeezing people's hearts left and right. It's kind of, kind of uh, distracting. How many I, people is murdering? I didn't know if it was just Bolana was. Um, I didn't know if I was supposed to chalk it up to Klingon because she gets her heart squeezed and then she's just like, "Oh, well, I got to get up to the console and fix something." It just pops right up and does it. So I don't know. It was it was one of those weird stories where I wasn't invested enough, and so I was noticing all the sort of weird problems with it, where it's like yeah. there's a lot of strange stuff here. Yeah, I found like neither one of them was invested in this hologram guy enough Mm -hmm. and i think that's kind of what's missing is i I think you kind of have to have i don't know maybe that's too cliche but it feels like you need to have one of them more invested to the point where they're not seeing the problem yeah and the other one being a little bit more aware of the problem and it would be kind of interesting if it was flipped then where 
Bolana was the one who was like, wow, I mean, he's been stuck in here forever. That would drive anybody crazy. And then the doctor being like, yeah, but you can't drive him crazy. He's a, yeah, he's a right. hologram. Yeah. You know, like that, that would be kind of interesting. Um, <clears throat> I think what would it would have been kind of interesting, would have been kind of cool is if, if the, I, I think that, so the way that they, introduce this to the ship is they get the distress signal the doctor comes up to the thing and they say oh yeah they show the thing oh, i'm a whatever x25 yeah projection t1000 thing <clears throat> yeah and the doctor is immediately like he's reacting as though he's the only irishman on the ship and they've yeah. just discovered another irishman yeah. you know yeah. like it's yeah. that's how he's he's very special reacting yeah right which is which is weird um it's strange that he views himself as a species. Um, or maybe it's not that weird. I don't know. Anyway, my point is, I feel like if they had got there and uh, Leland had was mo a more advanced hologram who had this disregard for humans, that might have put the doctor in a, a interesting position Um to how to deal with with that because he's he's meeting a hologram that's more advanced than he is and he's kind of taken by him right mm -hmm. and then as things go on he starts spouting this anti-human rhetoric and the doctor's like oh geez maybe this maybe this isn't something i should be aspiring to here you know yeah. like get, yeah. give the doctor something to to do um character wise and it, it, for balana it's not really it's nothing really going on for her she's just kind of discovering stuff yeah um, it's one of those stories where it's like it's just two people trying to figure out what happened, and it's not that interesting. Yeah, uh, inter like they, I thought it was kind of uh, it was a decision, right, where they reveal in the cold open that the his name is Dejarin, I guess Dejarin is a murder or like something's up with him, right? Like so, it's not mm -hmm. even a mystery that the audience is figuring out with Bolana and the Doctor, which might have maybe added a little bit of like, oh, like what's happening here sort of thing. But it, it's it's obvious from the start, which I thought was an interesting choice, that he is not well and that he's the one that killed everybody on the ship. It just takes our characters mm -hmm. a very long time to figure it out. Like, that's another minor thing. Like He's like, they all got sick and they died. And the doctor's not like, let me go see their bodies. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which, yeah. It's just kind of a weird... It's just one of those like why is why are the characters not doing things properly? Um, and that the, that excuse that he gives why Bolana can't go to the lower deck, it's like oh it's got antimatter radiation. Again, the doctor should be like oh well I'll go. Right, right. It doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> That's a good point. I was <clears throat> unless I was, it does. I don't know. I, don't I was know just thinking at that point Bolana should have just pulled out her tricorder and been like no it's not. There's no radiation down there. You know right, it's, it's yeah. she. It's just one of those script things. She waits ten minutes and then she figures it out uh, herself. Yeah. Um. Yeah. yeah it's he, just there's no. Uh, there's just no like. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump. No, it's, here, it's, but, um, I was just about to agree. It's like the doctor doesn't yeah. really have. The doctor mildly agrees with him. And then mildly disagrees with him. And then he goes crazy and attacks Bolana with a hammer. And then the doctor completely <laughs> disagrees with him. But it's not, yeah. they, they don't really have a, um, they don't have a data lore conversation where they're like, they're, you know, they play off of each other or they have opposing views. It's really just kind of, uh, <clears throat> they don't, honestly, I don't even think that for two holograms, they don't even really have a very interesting conversation with each other about, you know, right. what their place yeah. in the world is or anything like that. That would have been funny too, as if, the doctor started talking to Bolana after a bit, and he's like, you know, he and I have nothing in common. He's <laughs> right. just a bore to talk to. <laughs> just obsessed with his fish. Who cares about fish? Fish was a weird touch, too. But the yeah, perfect, just, cleanest animal. Yeah, they are. Obsessed, his obsession with cleanliness. It is next to, I guess it's next to godliness, right? So is that, the, is that what they're playing on? And God is empty. Just like, like him. Na, 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 Let's see. The Seven and Harry stuff. Mm. I would have liked this plot line in a show that was not Star Trek. <laughs> There's only so much that Star <laughs> Trek can do here before oh. it gets... Um, before it becomes inappropriate. There's only so far that they can go. And because they're limited... In, I in beg that, to differ. I had a whole other <laughs> script that I wrote for this one that they just refused to shoot. 
I was looking for the story credit because I said, guys, what if one of them, doesn't matter who, just really wants to get all up into that spacesuit? <laughs> it's not that tight. That's the the Star Trek. Like it's Star Trek is juvenile, and so when you have a storyline that's about one character wants to fuck the other character and the resolution is that character says how about you want to fuck me and he goes i i no <laughs> and he runs away <laughs> that's accurate honestly though accurate response from harry kim i he, uh, i think he, we'll, we'll, he, he would not know what to do with that if if it was no we're going to have a lot of comments a lot of comments in the patreon saying that harry fucked up i was like that was the most believable thing is that he once he was oh, presented 100%. with the ability yeah. he was like i don't know what to do um yeah I mean that that I feel that's a very that's kind of a just a relatable um he can talk a big game but when it comes down to it you're just like wait wait what what no no never mind I was just I was just talking Yeah it, I think it, like I, uh, my, as I was as we were watching this <laughs> towards the beginning of that whole sequence uh my girlfriend said um his boner is very distracting here Yeah it's the third. It's the third background extra, just hanging or, out. It was, or possibly upsetting. I think she might have said upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> it is upsetting. It's that's the Star Trek problem. You know, it's although I was, um, I was waiting for the final th- scene where Kim is trying to talk to Chakotay, and Chakotay's like, I "Need you to ride her hard." <laughs> it just goes back out there. No, not the way it's going to be. It was just. It's like. It's a fine, okay story for Seven at this point. Mm. It's just, in the context of Star Trek, it only comes across as kind of strange and weird. And, and it's not, it doesn't go to the level that it needs to go because they can't get to that gear. It's, it's not a show that can support the gear that this thing wants to get to and it wants to get kind of weird with it. Um, and they can't do it, so you're left with what you get. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I thought it was enjoyable, and I I found more interesting about it than the the hologram stuff, just mm-hmm. because, you know, I think it's, I think it's a, it's natural. Uh, well, I, I think the one good thing out of it was the, uh, the one really good thing was the Tom and Harry scene in the sick bay. Yeah, because um, they weren't the, the the conversation they have they were having wasn't about you know, the appropriateness of having sex with a subordinate, or I don't even know if she is a subordinate because she's not in Starfleet, so yeah. I don't know. Thanks, yeah. <clears throat> but it was it was Tom being like, she was a Borg last week and almost murdered you, and now she, just because she's hot, you want to sleep with her? And Harry's <laughs> like, no, I mean, <laughs> like like they were actually having, an, having a, a good conversation about biases. Yeah. You know, a good, it was fine. It wasn't. It's not Shakespeare, it you know, and yeah, but they're having an interesting conversation about biases under the blanket of wanting to sleep with this woman. Yeah, <laughs> so it was <laughs> like I was watching, going, okay, this that's kind of an interesting because the stuff Harry's saying was, although it was you know kind of tongue in cheek to an extent, mm-hmm. um, he was still making the arguments like, well, you know, I mean, nobody talks to her. I've talked to her; she's an interesting person. Yeah, and Tom is just like, yeah, well, she tried to kill everybody two weeks ago. You're just gonna forget that and he's yeah. like well you know like that was that was an interesting <laughs> i that's the kind of stuff i like yeah uh, from a character like this where again i i found it, the way um uh if, what the hell did she say um they they make some reference to uh oh cause he she was like oh aren't you afraid to work with me and he's like well no why would i be afraid and she's like well because two weeks ago I almost I tried to kill you so I could steal the ship and he's yeah, like yeah. Oh, wow. hit you at the base of your and she skull. says yeah and then she says I can gar- I promise you that won't happen again and she says it very sincerely yeah in a way where I was kind of wishing like I don't know I wish there's a little bit of stank on that to make you think like I don't know maybe she's yes is she joking with him yeah, like, yeah. like there's yeah. just there's just no um there's no uh ambiguity with seven at no. this point that really takes away a lot of potential for her. Yeah. <clears throat> as much as I do enjoy her as a character so far. Um, yeah, they got, they think, got rid of the could be... duplicity angle yeah. immediately, um, which is what and the I'm not even saying does. she needs to be, yeah, I'm not saying she needs to be duplicitous, but there's, there's not even like, it, it takes Tom Paris to bring it up. Yeah. To even suggest it. Cause before that, she's just like, no, I'm just, 
here trying to do a good job just like you. Yeah. So yeah. stop touching my ass. Her, her change is actually distracting in that it's it feels a little bit weird that Tom Paris and Harry are having that conversation about she was this way last week. It, it feels like she's yeah. been changed uh, for good at this point. Like it, it's a... The, the show is not particularly focused on her as a character to a point where it it feels authentic that the rest of the crew kind of don't trust her yet. Like you, you can mm. understand that in the abstract and that that's the way that they want things to be set out. But Seven has not acted in a way that would make you feel that all the characters in the background are having like gossip conversations about her. Um, that's kind of the like that's the problem with the character work so far i think is that the characters don't feel i I really like that the characters are talking to each other more here like i like the tom and balana stuff like it's kind of hokey still but it's like okay like we'll continue on with this path of these two who want to be in a relationship i just like the you know on, on, on a technical level this episode did something i don't think the show has ever done before uh which is there in the early opening there's a scene where the camera cuts between multiple conversations. It doesn't cut. It just follows multiple conversations. Like they, the doctor and someone are in the foreground, and then they step away, and the camera moves back into the back of the room, and oh, Janeway's sure. having a conversation with someone. Then it pans over Very to the left, and there's another conversation going. Very Robert Altman of them, too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the obvious influence. I don't think the show's ever done that, but it's also nice to, that the show is deciding to do that kind of thing right now, and I thought that that was a nice touch. It's just that the... The show did another thing that we've talked about before, which is that the opening scene where Tom and Harry are telling the joke about what they did to Tuvok at his ceremony feels Mm -hmm. like the most stilted, we are not really friends, we're actors pretending to be friends conversation that I've ever seen in Star Trek. They do this all the time on Voyager. They, They try to have them have these like mess hall crew meeting scenes where they all kind of like slap each other, you know, a little bit of like giving each other grief or whatever. And it yeah. never feels. It, I honestly, I cringe at it a little bit. I'm like, this is very awkward, and I'm like, I appreciate their acting uh, that they're able to get through this because I don't think but it's very Wes, good. How could you not? How could you not respond to a knee slapper of a joke, like <laughs> <laughs> changing all of the sound settings on <laughs> Tuvok's desktop PC? <laughs> Which I, as I will say, as I was watching that scene, I did have a flashback to when I was younger. When I did do that on my home computer, mm-hmm. I changed all of the error messages to quotes from Tommy Boy, <laughs> <laughs> which which was was good exactly for one of them, which is in, whenever you got like an error message, instead of that like dong that sound, it would be Chris Farley going, "What'd you do?" Which was pretty effective. <laughs> um, I did have a friend who did that uh, because you could you can do that with any MP3. You could plug any sound into those things mm-hmm. that you wanted. <clears throat> And so uh, a friend of mine, I think it was the startup noise, which had to play before you could do anything else on the computer. He changed to the long version of I would do anything for love, but I won't do that by meatloaf. Yeah. So when he turned on the computer, he had to listen to all 11 (laughs) minutes of the song (laughs) before he could do anything on his computer. (laughs) That's a good joke. That's pretty good. But... I will say that scene is as lame as it was. I think they could have. So I think this episode would have been improved if Harry wasn't actually trying to sleep with, wasn't actually hot for seven. Mm -hmm. But everybody was kind of like, like Tom was kind of playing it off as though he was. Because I think what would have been just to to get him angry or just like they think that he's. So I I think it would have been more interesting. If Harry's not actively, doesn't have the hots for her, he does literally just spend time with her and realize that she's a kind of a cool person. Mm-hmm. Because I think that beginning scene would have been a lot more impactful if while that was going on, they cut over to Seven, who's all by herself, yep. just in her pod or whatever. And yep. maybe you can like hear them all laughing through the wall in the distance or something. <clears throat> um, illustrating that divide that she kind of talks about in a very robotic way yeah. <clears throat> later on as something that is might actually be affecting her. So when she has these conversations with Harry, 
Harry is actually starting to learn about her and starting to see that there is a person in there. And so when he has this conversation with Tom, Tom takes the the um the more traveled approach, which is no, nah, you just you, she's hot. You just want to sleep with her. And he's, yep. Even even though she's a Borg, you're letting you're thinking with your dick. And Harry's like, no, actually, she's she's a good person. Like she's actually a, a cool person who no nobody is talking to. She's part right. of the ship, but yep. nobody wants anything to do with her. Like that's I find that I think that would have been a more um fascinating character move than just the British sex comedy on a starship. Yeah. And I, I think that's in line with my general flaw in it is that it's um the character interactions don't particularly feel authentic to this point. They just yeah. feel like they're kind of situations that are thought up and then the characters are plugged into them. It doesn't feel like there's a lot of like concern about making it seem like the the character interactions still do not feel like reality. They don't they don't feel like true conversations in some ways right um i think the obvious point of comparison is like i think ds9 does that really well like the characters there feel like they're fully formed entities that have you know even when they're talking in techno babble they have a like sort of like relationship underneath everything voyager's crew interactions feel more like soap opera interactions they don't like they feel very constructed um and so I don't I don't think that the show is really nailing that at that point as much as it's better to start doing that stuff. But the the seven as a sex joke feels that way. It doesn't feel like the show actually wants to concern itself with what seven is going through or what Harry is thinks that she's going through. They're just building it up as a kind of joke quirk thing yeah. that the two and then, you know, they can because it ends with just she says yes and then he gets freaked out, they can effectively drop it and hit the reset button and it's not ultimately all that noticeable. It just becomes a joke that fades away. Well, even there, that scene, I think, would have been more uh, effective if even Seven isn't, you know, used to Harry actively wanting to be friends with her. If, like, she's like, clearly you want to have sex, so we may as well just do that. And he's like, no, 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 no. Like, there's... That sort of thing there. So I don't know. I think I think they could have done something more uh, innovative with that setup yeah. than than just playing it straight for laughs. Even, I mean, even that being said, it was fine. I enjoyed it. Yep. Well enough. Yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was I thought it was fine. Like, do you? Um, is it strange that the show? So Seven's visual appearance. She's acknowledged in the show as being attractive. Like, so it's not just a we have a mm-hmm. hot actress who's wearing this and like no one in the show is noticing. You know, it's like a, we're we're living in a universe where Jerry Ryan is attractive, but also Seven is attractive to the characters right. on the show. Yeah. Um is that is that like what do you think of the decision to do that? Like that, that's a, it's kind of a, it's a choice to have the characters be aware of this as well and to like play mm-hmm. that up. Um, because it seems both vital to her character and completely non vital at the same time. And that like people don't yeah. care, but 90% of them don't care. But if Harry Kim shows the slightest bit of interest, everyone's like, "Of course she's fucking hot. Of course you want to you want to tap that. Of course you do." Like, and so they're very excited in the moment, but it doesn't drive anything else about Seven. So I I don't know yeah. I don't know how to think about it. I don't know if the show should have just been content to be like, "We brought a hot actress in and we put her in this skin tight suit, so all you nerds can gawk at her." And they should have just ignored her being sexy in universe, if that makes sense. You know, I actually like it because I do think that is something to. To, they would need to deal with in the setup of of what's going on inside the show, right? Because they're it's the same eighty people together yeah. for four years every day, yes. And every time you know, every time the whoever shows up and had, makes a hull breach, they lose like two of them. Yeah. So it's <laughs> We're fewer and one. fewer people. <laughs> yeah. And so to have someone new come in. And have that not be part of it, I think, would be a little disingenuous. Um, 
it is funny that it's like the show doesn't take it seriously though you know it's like that, it that's the voyager no. problem well the the thing that's funny is harry's literally the only character you could do it with because they're doing the tom and balana thing so you're not going to have tom go after her yeah chakotay is is just too earnest yeah to, to, to have like a <laughs> like you can't do you can't do like chakotay doing a double take like <laughs> like looking down at her chest kind of thing and that that's like and tuvok is yeah it really does tuvok. make sense yeah i can't do that. neelix would just be gross yeah so you can't it, it, harry's literally the only character you could do it with the, um, yeah the doctor i think the doctor and her could have a bond thing they, yeah they that's kind of, right yeah he was into cast so i guess that's true yeah she's the new cast to so just replace i i yeah, and definitely but no lesbian I guess, stuff. Get the fuck out of here. No, absolutely not. No. <laughs> um but yeah, so I guess it's I guess maybe that makes it a comedy by default because the only character you can really do it with is is a comedic character. But you know, Sorry who? For, I, I, for Kim, you mean? Sorry, Harry. Oh, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. Um just because he's so just because he's just not of her league, like uh, what, what? What do you mean by Joe character? Like their relationship is well, funny just, because they're they're not paired well. Yeah, he's just kind of a goof. Yeah, you know, right. he's he's not. Has he ever done anything that you've taken seriously? On the right. Show? No, he's. He, like, I, don't, him, I don't mean he's it, like he's not like a Neelix level character, but he's just like Harry Kim and a woman is never going to be like a steamy romance. Right. It's going to yeah, be yeah. played for laughs. Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> for what's his name, Garrett Wang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's always slipping on a banana peel at some point <laughs> landed face first in her boobs yeah <clears throat> yeah and that that <laughs> that brings up like the it's um, like so if jerry ryan is hot in the show does that mean that all the other characters are also considered to be their level of appropriateness. Is this laughing at Garrett Wang? You know what I mean? Like, is <laughs> I think you might be. I think you might be overthinking this one a bit. <laughs> is, this, is this the writer saying no one wants to fuck Garrett Wang, so we're going to have Seven of Nine uh, show him up for it? I think. Yeah, I think it's just. I think it's a. You might be overthinking it a bit. I think it's just. You know, if I don't know, I I, I think it's. It's it's. I think it works for adding someone new to the uh, proceedings. I think it it would. I think they should have done the same thing if they had added a a, a male character to yeah. the proceedings. You know, like it's. I think it's just having somebody new, regardless of even if it was. Uh, this sounds gross, but if it was someone less hot than Jerry Ryan, mm -hmm. I think it still would warrant the same kind of response, where it's like someone new, someone who's real. And of course, at least one person is going to be, you know, into it. Yeah. I Yeah. And I, I think that if Voyager was taking itself particularly seriously, this would be a conversation. Like there's a, sure. doesn't Harry have a girlfriend or something back home? Isn't, wasn't that a plot line or is that Paris? Yeah. Doesn't no, he have a girlfriend? I, I think so. He had that episode where something was. He had. He went back to like. He was back in San Francisco or something. He had a girlfriend. I don't know if that's. Yeah. Simultaneously, but like, there there's a lot of um, there's a lot of conversations to be had about we're on a long journey home, and any new meet is like of like because you've already, you know everybody on the crew, right? So there is something inherently interesting and appealing about a new person coming on board. Yeah. And I can understand that. It's just that the the show doesn't take itself seriously enough where the characters are going to talk about that because that seems like the realistic thing to portray on the show. Is this like how a small net family is being sort of infiltrated by this outsider person who's coming on and how that would shift uh, or shake things up? But uh, it's not here. It's just kind of laughing um, at the whole situation. It is. I, I do understand what you're saying though, because it is interesting to look at this show versus like, um, well, Enterprise. <laughs> Archer, Archer fell face first into Paul's tits enough that they clearly were were yes. making a joke out of it. They <clears throat> called her attractive but, um, too. They they acknowledged, sure. yeah. yeah. They, like, so you'd have to. It's an earlier thing. Like, well, yeah. I was gonna say it's if you look at what they're doing here versus like TNG, where Troy was 
dressed in a cat suit and is not an unattractive woman, and no one mentioned it. Ever. Yeah, no one brings it up. Not yeah. even, not even Riker. Right. <laughs> He's like, I love that woman, but it has nothing to do with any, the way she looks. No, at all. Just, like, <laughs> no, that's there's no one who popped their head in while she and Crusher were having stretch exercises right, to together and was like, you know, <laughs> much as we all hoped it would be. No, it's a it's a new it's a new thing to do because it. Yeah. Honestly, the you know, in the Roddenberry sense of the universe, that probably he would say like it doesn't matter. Like he's he'd be yes. like we've moved yeah. beyond attractiveness. It's just that's that's what's interesting to me about Seven because as as I, I think I said this when when she first showed up, they're really riding the line between the innovations of Star Trek and pre Star Trek sci fi stuff. Mm -hmm. Because in a pre Star Trek sci fi stuff, you've got someone. Uh, this voluptuous woman in a tight uh, jumpsuit. Uh, yeah, the people are going to be reacting to it in a way, you know, it, yep. it, it's not going to be unnoticed. Yes. Um, yeah. And so, and I think the, I think that aspect is more um, pre Star Trek sci-fi than Roddenberry sci-fi. Yeah. And Voyager's stuck in the middle of, yeah. of that situation. That's, um, that would be my point about like you bring her in and keep her the same, but you just no character mentions anything about it. Um, the I, I guess my problem with the people noticing it is that it seems to be the writing staff like overtly calling out the fact of what this casting was. You know, they're like, sure. we, we, yeah. we tried to yeah. sex the show up. <clears throat> so let's have a male character be like down with this <laughs> change, you know, and that, that's, that seems, um, that seems honest, but also sort of like creatively bankrupt at the same time. Like you're starting to just, you're just like, well, we brought yeah. this in cause we needed someone more attractive than Cass. And this is the way things worked out. But is this where the, is this where the argument or the, the hatred between her and Mulgrew started? Was she like, how come, how come no one ever wants to have sex with the captain? <laughs> The only, the only thing Janeway ever got was a firm handshake <laughs> and a parting of the ways from Chicote. <laughs> that's that. That would be. I guess that's it. They just didn't find the bun sexy, or Jane, I don't I even know. know what Janeway's hair is at this point. Um, it's all just a mishmash to me. It might have been. I think she. I mean, yeah. I, I, is that because that would be a core? Is just the show's being like, well, we just need sexy people, and we'll give sexy people all the lines. And sorry, Kate. Um, Back of the line to you. Anything else about it? Is it really does signal? I guess they only really did they stop doing this after Enterprise. I mean, obviously, there's nothing on the air for a while after Enterprise. But like, <clears throat> well, I guess they did it in the 2009 in Into Darkness. They played what's her name? Um, oh, the Admiral's daughter. Kirk's yeah, Kirk's girlfriend. They get yeah. the, that bra and panty scene. Yeah, <clears throat> but like, yeah, it seems like it's a weird trend that, thankfully, I guess, got snuffed out by the end of the franchise. Yeah, uh, because they starts here and then in Enterprise. As much as I think T'Pol is a pretty good character, it's like, you know, obviously she's there because she's hot. Well, that's I shouldn't say that. That's mean. But like there, there is having a, a, a hyper attractive woman seems like it's part of the mix now in a way that it didn't used to be. Yeah, I think I actually respect it a little bit more in, in Enterprise because mm -hmm. the Enterprise prequel thing would and all the the male characters on that show con would frequently talk about how attractive T'Pol was. Like that, yeah. it, it was like a discussion point. Here, and it's also it's also more of like a. There's like a weird like cultural thing baked into it yes. instead of just like yeah, yeah. Where no one knows why seven of nine is dressed this way. <laughs> to Paul makes a little bit. To Paul is the humans learning about Vulcans in that yes. way. It's, it's so there's yeah. like a little bit of like this like, and I think that that pairs nicely when they're super horny and she's just like cold and heartless yeah. to them. You know, so there, there's like there's a um, a sort of like getting to know each other aspect there that I think works. I don't know if the show did the best that it could with it, but it, it makes a little bit more sense than here, which is that 
you know, if, if this show wants to go with the sexy thing, characters should start going like, can you put on like a, a blazer or something? <laughs> I just can't focus with you, uh, with your extremely hippie silhouette blocking out all the, cons- all the console controls and stuff like that. But they're not going to they're not going to do it. They do change her jumpsuit, I think, at some point. Right. I don't think she constantly yeah. wears this gray thing all the time. It's, I think it gets more purple and yeah. less shiny. Yeah, less shiny. More like a flat color. Yeah. Yeah. Because I remember it being more, um, this doesn't feel very soft. I I, I feel like in my mind's eye, she wears like a soft outfit that's sort of more, it's form fitting the same way, but it's much more like Troy's outfit in that way. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, Anything else? Although, I mean, maybe we're giving T and G's too little credit for casting a hot woman Mm -hmm. in a jumpsuit. Yeah, and the fact that they just don't say anything about it does that make it more classy? You know, well, it, it lives up to what I think the show was trying to say about itself. For you know, you can you can say it's the you can use the real life casting uh, as you know, just be like, oh, well, attractive people are going to get cast at it. But the show didn't pay any special heed to it in the same way that um, you know that famous story about like. One of the executives saying, you can't be Patrick Stewart because he's bald. We can't have like a bald leading man on this oh, show. Sure, and he yeah. said, in the future, no one's going to care about people being bald. Um, I think Roddenberry did stick to that fairly strongly for better or for worse. I <laughs> I really like that explanation or or comeback because it, it imagines some crazy world where right now there are no bald captains in the world. Yeah. And this producer is like, you know what? You have a point. I've never seen a ball cap. <laughs> In the future, not going to be an issue. Not, not going to be an issue. No one's going to care. Everyone's going to have hats. It's going to be fine. <laughs> wouldn't he have hair plugs or something? No. No, he wouldn't. Not at all. Uh, anything else about this one? Dejarin. I would not have predicted that was to be his name. I'm only learning that because I'm looking at the thing here now. Um, that sounds really familiar. Look, I so feel like a name similar to that has kind of been a, used in something else. Kind of a mustardy, <clears throat> mustardy flavor. How did you think about the way he goes out where they Pavlov's gun, the the cable that he can't touch and it pa- kills him. Pavlov's gun. <laughs> 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 that's that's only in the south where every time you see an M sixteen you start drooling. <laughs> I can't say Chekhov. It's too <clears throat> it's too it's too correct in terms of Star Trek. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was, it was fine. I kind of thought like that whole bit was just kind of anticlimactic. Yeah. Um, why can't he, again, why, why is know... shutting the door on a hologram stop him from coming into the room? Well, I thought it was going to work because she said she shut down all his hollow emitters, except for that one in the other room. So I assumed that he wouldn't have been able to get into that room. He's just but, stuck there. I don't know. I don't know how stuff works. Yeah, he can, he can go anywhere on there. He can walk through the wall. I, I thought he was going to do the, um. T one thousand in the, the jail T where the thing gets stuck. Yeah, where he that goes through good. the bars and like his little like tricorder gets stuck behind it or something. But that would be good. It. Or his hammer, right? Because he's carrying the hammer at that point. Um, Chicote has a laugh at Harry's expense. That's the image. All right, I guess we'll just go to the patron comments though because we got how good else. of a detail is that by the way in T two, <clears throat> the gun getting stuck. Gun in getting the bars. stuck is nice. Yeah, excellent, yeah. excellent detail. Help her. Um, let's see here. All right, so this is Revulsion that I have found it. So if you guys enjoyed the content today, you can go to patreon.com slash the Penske file. And for a couple dollars, you can leave your thoughts about upcoming episodes. We read them. And there's also 200 plus podcasts over there. Patreon.com slash the Penske file. Welcome 2024. Have we ever, we haven't done either of the Terminator movies, have we? No. That's a shame. Those are good movies. (laughs) It's not on any of the lists, right? Maybe that'll be the first Patreon we can do. Um, terminator movie or something like that i'll put up that in a, i'll put up a sci-fi poll for the movie uh there's a whole bunch of other patreon stuff too so we can't get too crazy with uh goals but we can certainly do that one because it is surprising that we haven't done that yet uh we, i i still regret the fact that we stopped real ripe real rotten right before we were supposed to do arnold schwarzenegger i think yeah. right yeah he was the next one <clears throat> yeah and so we would have been doing End of Days, which I was very excited about. End of Days and Terminator, I think, was the, the yeah. number one. So maybe we'll just do, and, we'll do End of Days and Terminator. And I think I think we were saw, we were on deck to do Demolition Man for something, too. 
whether that was just like a sci-fi movie that got picked that we never ended up doing. I can't Yeah, because we wouldn't have, there wouldn't have been an actor, right? Who it wouldn't? No, because we didn't do anybody else. Maybe it was just we were just talking about doing it because it's one of those movies that needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah. Revulsion. Oops. Let me find the first comment. What the hell is it? Kyle Barrett says, Revulsion. I think this is low-key one of the best episodes of Voyager yet. It nails the storytelling structure of the show could have been, reintroducing the relevant ongoing serialized character stories at the promotion party before threading them throughout an episode which is largely standalone. The horror story is fun and creepy with a great guest star performance by Leland Orser, bringing some of that big knife dick energy to the role. I was unsure of the Harry and Seven subplot possible uh, because only a handful of episodes in and they're already falling back on people wanting to fuck her as a storyline. But what makes it work is Seven's fantastic reaction to it. What sets Seven apart from characters like Data is that she recognizes what's happening, identifies the signs instead of being oblivious and needing them explained to her, but can't effectively navigate the situation. Reacting without the emotional rigmarole some deem necessary is unabashedly blunt and is an icon in the autism community because of it. Four out of five. <clears throat> yeah. Tax Albert says revulsion. Harry Kim doesn't get laid again. Also, the doctor meeting another hologram is pretty neat, even if the twist of the episode is somewhat predictable. I wonder whether it would have been more interesting to make the other hologram also a doctor and present him as a result of a path that the Voyager doctor could have been. Yeah. That would work. Yeah. Literally anything. <laughs> pasty and white. Yeah, who cleans the, the the toilets or whatever the hell he does on that chip. Yeah. Malo Perverso says, this episode me wants to vomit, and I mean that in a negative way. Yet, how about a few comments on how gullible and trusting the Federation people really are, going blindly into what could have easily been an elaborate ambush by thieves and or killers. Fortunately, it happened to just be one lone short killer in this case. Stupid fools. Also, do they really need to respond to every damn distress call they receive? Why did they send them on a shuttle to go get the ship. No idea. <laughs> I was thinking that too, because it's like, wait, so the ship is five light years away. <clears throat> and so they have to go away while Voyager is still going at high speeds forward. Home, yeah. So, yeah, so like how are they going to catch, I don't know. What was Voyager Whatever. doing? during? What, the, what, they weren't doing anything, right? They weren't. It was Five light years for them is like taking the a, a dog a for a turn walk down there. one street you know yeah. it's it's like half a mile it's not even their home quadrant or jurisdiction or responsibility or even their main secondary job function they're explorers not rescuers why do they keep sticking their noses so deep where it doesn't belong in my humble opinion because there would Jane, be no show if they didn't in my <laughs> humble opinion why. captain janeway added so much damn time to their trip back home with that bs that she and the crew could have easily ignored and avoided and it kind of became frustrating show to watch sometimes for viewers like me like uh, no listen, rating. Listen, if you want to play Red Dead Redemption Two, mm -hmm. and just do the main story, you can do that. But some people, Captain Janeway included, like, like to quests. do side quests, and you know, find somebody's hat and <laughs> ride seven hundred miles on a horse <laughs> to bring it back to them. There's nothing wrong. Only to accidentally kill them because they forgot how the controls work. This is that is my constant battle. <clears throat> How to fire the gun. They also made in that game <clears throat> the fire gun and like threaten somebody's the same button press or something like that with a modifier. Just like in the real world. Yeah. This is a uh, changeling. With the likes of Harry Kim pursuing her, it's no wonder that Seven converts to lesbianism in Picard. I guess he is really determined to bang someone before making it home to his fiance. Yeah, right. What he has a, a fiance. Pig. Okay. Yeah, I think so. An AI revolting against its masters is typical sci-fi schlock, but the subplot makes the episode unbearable. Also, Tuvok gets a promotion, shrug, and Tom becomes the new nurse. What? Howard Hughes hologram, oh, sorry, one Howard Hughes hologram making everything clean and free of little tiny germs <laughs> out of five. A one, one out of five. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, Tom becomes the nurse again. Um, it's fine. Bob, Bob JK. Sure. I've forgotten Sounds how to pronounce good. Bob's name and I looked it up and now I'm, now I'm doubting myself. So I'll just say Bob JK. Revulsion. Notice this time that the hologram in Bolana's You Eat Like a Fish conversation is a beat by beat tribute to Norman and Marion's You Eat Like a Bird scene in Psycho. Oh, there you go, Clive. And Roxanne oh. Dawson can do a good sure. Janet Lee when called upon. 
I also like the idea of an away team consisting of a human who fixes machines and a hologram who fixes humans. The rest of it was okay, but not outstanding. Three out of five. Matt Ross says, Revulsion, they revealed the killer hologram a bit too early, but Leland Orser, who plays the character in Psychotic, very well. Bolana and Paris's nascent relationship seems almost high school level of story, and Kim should have said yes to Seven's obnoxious offers, but he's Kim. The weirdest little thing is watching Bolana manipulating a really phallic power um, rod. That was, I noticed that as well, that joystick yeah. she's jerking around <laughs> to, to fix something. It's very strange. That was a... Uh, that was an. I would have had a questions as an actress in that too. Like, why does this have to look like this? <laughs> okay. There's never been another ship in this fucking franchise that has a a power rod that looks like a dick that I have to pull off. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you've never been on this show before, Roxanne. <laughs> in here, Berman in the back is like, pull it harder. Harder. <laughs> the weirdest thing is watching Bolana uh, uh, manipulate the really phallic power rod. The doctor's last line mirroring the hatred and disgust of biological beings from the deactivated hollow was disturbing. Three oily residue on stuffs out of five. I do think it is kind of funny to say they revealed the killer too early when it was literally the first scene. Yes, of the <laughs> I guess you could argue. It's he, about as early as it could be. We don't know that he killed them. I guess there's the, it's, I mean, obviously That's it, is, true. it is obvious that he did kill them, but where, where did, you know, another one of the, like, why did he, besides the fact that you want to have a reveal, why did he hide them behind the consoles? Their dead bodies. I don't know. You know, it's like, it's just strange. For someone obsessed with cleanliness, you would have thought they would be like neatly stacked somewhere or he, you know. Sort of just them. dump them. Yeah, throw them out the, the door and be done with them. Yeah. Just say they were infected. So. Right. Yeah. This is Jaron Hatch with Revulsion. Do you think our fastidious holographic serial killer is going to murder right Lisa Klink for how messy this episode is? Mm. Hopefully not, because it's a good concept that could have made for some interesting character work for the Doctor. <clears throat> Unfortunately, aside from the bland Star Trek slasher flick aesthetic, Voyager once again does absolutely nothing with it. Leland Orser puts in a fine performance, but his character should have been far more sympathetic than the one-dimensional psychopath he portrays. And then there's the appropriately labeled B-plot, where apparently resistance to Seven of Nine's Borg boobies is futile, even for a female staff writer. 2.5 promoted rank pips out of five. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Lisa Klink might have been a lesbian. I don't know. Couldn't see it on the I mean, memory alpha. Or, <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> or, just, or just heterosexual interested in breasts. Uh, where the hell am I? Right there. Point Extra G says, Revulsion. This episode is the first of several, quote, what it means to be a hologram stories in Voyager. This is the first of those? I, oh, feel, like, I feel like it's awesome. Been, I feel like, well, I feel like we've every Doctor storyline has been that to, to this true. point. Yeah. The hologram gone insane idea is interesting enough, but I think a lot more could have been done with him stalking and going after Bolana. They've already started giving Seven some screen time, and it's good to see that they're getting into that right away. They need to establish her personality now that she's no longer a Borg, and having her work with the other crew members gives her a chance to do so. I do uh, think that there is another <clears throat> universe where it almost feels like a more thing they would do on, a, on one of the modern shows to introduce seven of nine and then immediately send her to the back of the bus, you know, Mm -hmm. where she's like, she's there, but you know, she's not really focused on, but so it's good that they've, they've spent some time actually doing stuff with her. Yeah. Excuse me. I, well, we're only like five episodes in and she's been in like three of them. So yeah, I think, I think there's only been one. I think she wasn't in the last week's episode, whatever that one was, but I think she's been in every episode since then. Uh, Yarpy says, Revulsion, the episode where Harry Kim cock blocks himself again. Kim, when a hot chick asks you if you wish to copulate, you say yes. Otherwise, typical A-OK Voyager episode two or maybe just barely three out of five. Grapple John Zorn says, Revulsion, Harry discovers he's gay after seven gets damaged when they pull it out. They... That, <laughs> that actually made me laugh, though. What is she, she says it's like a... Whatever she describes, just pull the thing out as was it was just kind of a funny little Star Trek joke. Yeah. Uh, 
Where are we? Artorius. I'll do this when you get the next one. The serial killer vibe was predictable and obvious from the first scene. Leland Orser does a good performance in the role, as does the Doctor and Bellana. Harry had the shot of a lifetime with someone far out of his league, but he didn't have the balls for it. Probably doesn't have the balls for anything. Apparently, Tom does with Bellana, even if it seems very fast in their relational development. Two broken holograms out of five. Yeah, the um, the Tom and Bellana thing when uh, fine, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. it, it's just that you know they they bring up the fact that um, their communication about this was done on like the precipice of death, but that doesn't really seem to cause any issues. They're now, they're now together, right? We can just say that they're a couple at this point. I, 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 I suppose so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what, is, what does Amy call it? Amy had a word for that when you decide that you're actually in a relationship. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> uh, it just happened yesterday. This is the next, <laughs> for you next, guys? Yeah, the next comment here for this. He's, I think he's the last one. Let me check. Yes, this is the last comment from Jonas. Revulsion. This episode was solid, serviceable Trek. Nothing to write home about, but an episode with surprisingly engaging character interactions all around. The guest actor was superb in his role, however predictable. I could watch Seven all day. If she won't assimilate Garrett's wang, I know of a Jeffrey's tube ready for a nanoprobe. Ho-ho! Why, why are you selling yourself so short there, pal? <laughs> Three Rye Lieutenant Commanders out of five. <laughs> Jeffrey's tube is also an insult to our beloved Jerry Ryan. I think. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on a second here. I'm trying, still trying to unpack this. <laughs> if she won't assimilate Garrett's wang, I know of a Jeffrey's tube ready for a nanoprobe. Whose tube is it? You think it's Jonas's tube? It might be, which I mean, hey, that's fine. More power to you. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is only possible on planets like Ryza. This is I know of a Jeffrey's <laughs> tube, right? Well, it might just be a beginner, I suppose, with the nanoprobe. Thank you very much, everybody, for leaving your thoughts and horny dialogues about what is this revulsion, which is a fitting title. We'll be back next week with the next episode. You guys can leave your thoughts on patreon.com slash the Penske file if you want to leave your thoughts and we'll read them. Whatever that one is. I think it's is it is it the Raven? Are we already at that episode? It is. Ooh. It's the Raven. Is the next one. So Clay, what I are you going to give this I look forward to one? it uh, perching itself on a bust of Pallas above my chamber door. It does. <clears throat> good. Good. Perched um, and sat, and nothing more. And what do you What do you think that we're consumed about? Why Why are we so miserable? And what does the Raven represent in this episode? Um, what do you think on a scale of one to five about revulsion? Mm, I have a three. It's fine. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it a two, I think. Um, it was fine, but wonky. Uh, but I am I do think that this season of Voyager is noticeably better than the previous one. Even the bad episodes are like, eh, this is watchable. Um, so that's good. But yeah, I didn't think this was a very strong episode uh, yeah. so, so far. I am, I'm getting worried that the show is um, sliding into... Uh, I don't know how to describe this really, but um, <clears throat> there's a certain kind of syndicated science fiction mm. where you turn it on and you see two people being really intense about something you don't care about, yeah, and then you kind of just change the channel. Yep. I'm worried that it's turning into that, <laughs> you know, where it's like if you're flipping channels and you turned on Leland Orser and uh, what's his name there, Picardo. Picardo and Leland Orser is just like, you don't understand. The people are just so disgusting and I can't deal with it. I'm a, I'm a hologram. <laughs> and you're just like, all right. I mean, yeah. Like, it, like the sets are starting to look kind of like drab. And yeah. Yeah. No, I can see that. We went, uh, it's funny you bring that up. We, um, we were in New Hampshire the other day and we stopped at a restaurant and, the, and the, just, there was a TV on in the background. And it's just funny how, you can tell a sci-fi movie, like a sci-fi channel sci-fi movie, yeah. ju like just by looking at it immediately. You know exactly oh, what it like, is. Yeah. It's, it's so... It's garbage. It looks like garbage. Yeah, it looks like garbage. But it, it's like, even the ones that have a, a budget, there's something about it that it's just like, wow, this is just 
it, it's just it looks so it's obviously shot on digital the set is mm-hmm. clearly just like kind of like artificially made and they're just standing in this space and everyone's sweaty for no particular reason like everyone's <laughs> glistening it's just it's I just thought it was it really struck me as like wow they definitely have a uh, a look on this channel about how these things are supposed to be I don't find them charming in the way that old like B movies yeah. or C D movies tend to be. Yeah. Um they just they're ugly to look at and I just don't find anything charming about them. I think because they're a little bit too aware of themselves now. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> that whatever charm you might get from like an Ed Wood movie where it's like, yeah, this is people are still kind of doing their best here, even if their best is not very good. Yeah. But you know, if you're watching Ian Ziering and Tara Reed fight flying sharks, it's like <laughs> this, I don't really find this charming. Yeah, no, it's it's true. They are they are very ugly, ugly movies. Uh, that's it for this one. I'll, I'll give it a two. If I didn't say, yeah, it's a two for me. It's a three for you. So that's it for Revulsion. The Raven will be the next episode, and I realize that I have to put up the comments for the next six episodes. So I'll do that too on Patreon. All right, cool. That's it. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Patreon.com slash The Penske File, all that stuff. We'll have new content in 2024. This is our first Star Trek episode of 2024 for the main feed, so thank you. Welcome to a new year, and check out the Patreon for all the stuff that's going to be on it this year. I'll put up a post about that. Clay, do you have anything you want to say? Uh, we just, last at the end of last year, wrapped up the Video Nasty series on Patreon for the Rotten Horror Picture Show, and in January 2024, we begin our trek through Haddonfield, Illinois with the Halloween series, which is uh, it's, le- it's milestone 36th anniversary in 2024. Mm-hmm. Mi- missed it by one year. That's all right. Um, it's a, thankfully, we got Exorcist on the 50th. We got one of them. You got but, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> it can be um, hard. That's a lot of pre-print. That's a lot of pre-production to get the dates right. I didn't even think about it. And then I started seeing like, it's, uh, no, it's, no, it's not, not 35th, 45th. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. It was the 45th anniversary last year. Um, and my first thought was who celebrates the 45th anniversary of anything? No. It's usually once you pass like 30, it's like the tens you think. Yeah. But, you usually do the tens. Um, yeah. Unless, you're, unless it's uh, marriage, I guess that's a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. I guess maybe they're worried. People, there's not going to be enough people alive. Yeah. You, for you got to see, you got to start maximizing how, yeah. how many people know about this. Um, but yeah, so we're doing Halloween this year. Uh, we're doing 12 of the 13 movies. We're not doing Halloween 2018 cause we did that on our main feed, but we will probably talk about it as we get into that series. Um, I'm actually really interested to get into that because unlike f- most of the other series, long running series like Friday the 13th or Nightmare on Elm Street, or even something like Saw, um, Halloween has time to think about stuff between movies, mm-hmm. which sometimes is a good thing and sometimes is a bad thing. Yeah, it's not it's not like Friday the Thirteenth where there are they made eight of them in seven years or whatever it is. They, yep. There are big chunks of time between these movies, and uh, they they I'm gonna be I think I'm gonna be pulling from. There's a book called Taking Shape and the Taking Shape Part Two, which is about. First one's about the making of Halloween, every Halloween movie. The second one is specifically about all the unmade sequels yep. um, that were tossed around, which are pretty interesting. So I think I'm going to be pulling from that book a bit when we get into the sequels uh, to see where things could have gone and where they ended up. So There you go. Patreon, 2024 content from Clay and Amanda is Halloween. 12 episodes of it. Thanks, everybody. I guess we're done. We'll be back with The Raven next week. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for supporting the show, and we'll see you next time.